great. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, like Beth was saying, just just chime in at any point. You can either raise your hand or, or like I said, there's not too many folks on here. If you unmute and just have a question, just unmute. I'm, I'm used to being interrupted. Um, just to give you a little background about myself, I started off in a trade in, back in 1990 in, in New York City, uh, worked continuously until about 2007. I was on some big, you know, we did a lot of transit work, a lot of schools. Uh, I was on a new Seven World Trade Center. Uh, a, a high-rise apartment building right next door on the south side of the site, 90 West Street. That was was actually an insurance total on 9/11 that they turned over into residential uh, research centers for schools. So kind of a, a wide variety of stuff. And, and talking to some of our guys, uh, you, you know, that have a lot of field experience, our, our local contractor guy out here, most of his experience with feeders are on, on horizontal. You know, data centers are underground. Whereas most of my feeder experience is vertical because we're doing high rises, right? So just there's some some intricacies there as you think about how you do these jobs and, and how you manage it. So like I said, we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive on, on what we need to be thinking about when we're planning and particularly these cable poles in order to plan for success and just some factors you can you can ideate of, of, of coming up with that plan ahead of time. Um, to make that day as smooth as possible. A lot of time, feeder poles, a lot of money involved, usually a lot of, a lot of time involved, a uh, handful size crew, a lot of stress around this. You know, you see owners show up on jobs. Uh, sometimes they get ulcers based upon what they see going on a job. Like this picture here, this is, this is a picture, I think, I believe uh, Bill Fowler had taken it down when he was in, down in Puerto Rico of this, the cable pole, right? Tied to that truck. We're not quite sure what the, the pole rate, rating on that truck is, if it's got a front hitch or not. Um, do you see stuff like this happen on job sites? I absolutely. Use, I've seen people use forklifts. We see people using, uh, we were driving out to Las Vegas a couple weeks ago, a solar job. Um, they had they had the cable spool set up on, on front end loaders. <laughs> um, not the ideal way, but people are gonna find a way. But where you get into the issues is, like sure that truck can pull pull a lot of force. But having that much rope out in the open, probably not the proper rope for the job either since something else they seem to have is, is proper. Uh, that rope's gonna have a lot of stretch in it. If that rope were to break, uh, you know, it's gonna tear up the front end of that truck, possibly penetrate the windshield, you know, depending upon whether it's clevis or not. That, that guy right there is in real bad shape, right? So we wanna avoid these things. We wanna do it safely. Like we talked about this morning, most of you guys were on this morning. Um, labor's at a premium right now. You know, there's, there's all, all sorts of studies coming out from the different trade organizations on, on the need for electricians. Uh, and I was on our department labor site this morning looking at some things up. Um, you know, over the next couple of years, I think next year they're expecting to need about 80,000 electricians. And I went and looked at their data on apprenticeships. Well, there's 40,000 people in apprenticeships currently for, you know, all four years of these things. You're getting a lot of people retiring out of the industry. In addition to the growth in the industry, they're looking at, you know, about 100,000 new jobs total over the next eight to 10 years. But you also need to replenish the 60, 70,000 people that are leaving the industry each year. And just kind of the way our population structure is set up, we have more people leaving than, than uh, an aging out of the industry than coming into it. All right, so when we think about setting up a, a, a cable pull process, this is where our thought process wants to be. We wanna do a job hazard analysis, right? Studies have shown that if we come up with a plan of how to mitigate these hazards, uh, possibly just eliminate them by going a different way, everybody's going to be safer. We need to think about that feeder schedule. So we call it the good plan of, of the order we're going to pull things in, how we're going to set stuff up to pull. We want to look at where are we setting up the reels. You know, some folks have a preference that we're always going to Pull from the service room or always going to feed from the service room. Um, and it really just depends. Depends upon what's going to make the most sense. 
And part of the way to figure that out is by doing a cable pull calculations. We'll, we'll talk briefly about that. We had a class on the cable pull calculator the other day. We need to think about the real sizes and weights because how are we handling those when they show up to the job? How are we getting them to where we're going to be feeding from? Uh, how are we getting them off of the truck? How are we putting together our pulling head? Um, and lots of different ways to do that. If you get 20 electricians in a the room, they're all going to tell you how they would do it, and their way is the best. All right. The rope and pulling equipment, we want to make sure they match the tensions we're going to, we're going to be experiencing so we don't have any failures. What other equipment do I need to have on hand to make that job? You know, what kind of checklist do I have to make sure I have all the bits and pieces I need so I'm not waiting on a piece of material or, a, or an Allen key, let's say. How are we moving those reels around a job and, and lifting them both on and off trucks and into various spaces? And then kind of the end most important step is that debrief and document. You have a poll, hopefully it was successful. Um, even if it was successful, there might've been some complications that hadn't been anticipated. How do we document that to ensure we're gonna be as efficient as possible moving forward and as safe as possible moving forward? And if the poll went flawlessly, well, why did it go flawlessly? What things did you account for to make sure that happened so that you can continue to build on that success, right? Things go wrong where we get into trouble is if we continue to do the things that cause things to go wrong. All right, so we want to talk about our job site support. We have our folks, our field tool specialists, or, or that name's transitioning into contractor equipment specialists. Um, these, these are our folks you see, they have the South Wire trailer. They're going to come out to your job, make sure you're comfortable using the equipment. Uh, they'll demo some equipment for you. Some some cases they'll help you do like a, a poll as a comparison. Our contractor solutions professionals, this is kind of an additional support team that that you're not paying for. These these folks help you plan that job, look at the job ahead of time and think about what solutions we have and the best way to make use of those solutions to be efficient. They can help you run through those cable pull calculations we're gonna talk about in a minute. Our agents and distributors. Well, these, these are kind of our boots on the ground. These are the people you're contacting to get the stuff to show up on a job site. And we were talking a little bit about some medium voltage work and, and jobs of that nature. Our cable tech support services, this is a, an engineering team. I mean, they know all the in and out of these wires and, and you know can help you get through certification processes and, and some of those processes because this is what they do on a daily basis, particularly you know on some of that utility work or that high voltage work. All right, just to tell you a little bit more about what we do as a team at Southwire. So there are three trainers, myself, Johnny Sellers, and Bill Fowler. You know, in addition to we have Beth and Christy that kind of run things for us. Um, so we run our trainings, but in addition to that, we're training partners. We're kind of the highest level partners with NECA and the IBEW uh, and the ETA, the Training Alliance. That's the apprenticeship program. That's, it used to be called the Joint Apprenticeship Training Committee. A few years back, they changed it over to ETA. The IEC, the Independent Electrical Contractors, and then also the Associated Builders and Contractors, and we do some work with Skills USA for their competitions. All right, what we do at these chapters is we donate tools and equipment and training. Um, we also help make sure the curriculums are up to date. I'm on um, a subject matter expert for NCCR, which does the curriculum that most of the ABC chapters are using. We then, in addition to donating this equipment, well, we're going to show them how to use it, how to be safe while using it, and talk about, you know, in addition to our product, just safety in general and, and things to be looking out for on the job to be more efficient and, and make sure you don't get hurt. Um, as a matter of fact, we were out, myself and our contract specialist out here, we were at a, a Las Vegas chapter last week doing a training with about 40 apprentices, uh, fourth year apprentices run them through the cable pole calculator and, and showing them how to use the tools to make the make their pole safe and efficient. Uh, we also help do with continuing education for wiremen. And we have our top gun apprentice program, which is just kind of a, an incentive for those apprentices to, to be the best they can be. All right, when we talk about pre-planning, so Southwire has a couple different ways to help plan, right? We have our various calculating tools. We have our cable pole calculator. We have a uh, voltage drop calculators, and we have a handful of other things. They're all available on the resources tab of our website. 
installation manuals, like literally Southwire wrote the book on some of these uh, manuals on, on how to safely install the cables, you know, and also make sure the cables don't get damaged. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look in, in most of the curriculum materials, even in even in some of the uh, you know trade publications, a lot of those diagrams and stuff come out of our installation manuals. Configurator Plus, we'll dive into a little bit more detail what that can do for you. And then we have mobile apps. Um, sometimes you just need something real quick on a job site. And, you know, you don't want to have to follow the laptop. You can just do it on your phone or iPad or, or other tablet. And then we have a slew of videos, you know, both on our website and particularly on our YouTube presence has, has grown a lot over just the past six months to a year. The and a lot of work has gone in recently to organizing those videos to make it easier to find what exactly it is you're looking for. So we recommend you check that out. All right, we talked about the first thing we want to be doing is looking at a safety a safety plan, that job hazard analysis, right? So we think about the tasks involved, and this is, you know, its primary cause is safety. The primary reason for doing this is safety and keeping people safe. But what it really does is it kind of forces your hand into thinking about the steps in the process. Um, and sometimes we get into a habit of we've done something so many times, you just kind of mindlessly do it, but then you're missing some things in the mix, right? So when you think about how, what are those hazards, how can we mitigate those hazards or eliminate them completely, and then come up with our poll plan, and then we want to document how we're doing that so that that gives us the basis for that debrief we're going to do at the end. And then you want to take that polling crew and make sure everybody's on the same page with that. Do a little safety meeting, make sure they're all familiar with the equipment they're using, any particular hazards for this poll that might be out of the ordinary. Right. So if we just kind of look at this sample here, well, well we need to receive and stage the wire reels. Well, what are those hazards? You know, these are kind of your more acute injuries, your back strains, your your knee injuries or hands, crushing injuries, you get something caught between the reel and the, the loading dock. Uh, they do have some repetitive tasks about them. Feeling, crouching, are we trying to flip those reels upright? Well, what can we do to mitigate that? Well, we want, if we have those wires delivered parallel on stacked reels, and we'll dive more into that in a second, um, it's minimizing the number of reels we have to have to handle. So anytime you're minimum, you know, you're decreasing the number of operations you're doing, you're going to decrease the potential for injuries there. Um, what mechanical lifting devices can we use for the reels? Make sure we're not trying to lift with our backs and legs. And then can we eliminate jack stands entirely? All right, serving up the pulling head, what kind of injuries do we have here? Uh, hands and wrist sprains, particularly cuts. Well, we can just eliminate that entirely and take that off the job by having those heads crimped on at the factory or distributor. All right, we're pulling the wire. We can think about back strain or, or people physically pulling by hand. Um, is there back strain involved in setting up whatever equipment? You know, there's the cut hazards from the edges of panels. Recoil in a rope, that tension in a rope if the rope were to break. Uh, carrying wire around, right? Well, what if we made it so we don't need to lube the wire? It's low friction. Every piece has been designed to work together and we're minimizing that material handling of having to pull wire out of boxes and, and push them back into back feed. And so we're gonna, talk individually about how we address all these. And then that planning, right? Lack of planning has multiple hazards. Most primarily is just not knowing what that pulling tension is gonna be and having no input into whether or not that's gonna create a situation for us, right? So we can go ahead and do those calculations ahead of time and make sure we eliminate that hazard. Hey Joe, if I could, if I could throw in here, uh, you know, that safety plan, the one Joe is showing is a very simple, basic one. I've seen them as simple as this. I've done them where they were pages long. It all depends on the complexity of, of what you're doing. The point here is if you have that safety plan and you do that on every pool, then that becomes ingrained in the, in the culture of your crews doing these pools. And, and it just, it, I, I can't tell you in my career, the times we've seen our safety plan save the day because we knew what the hazard was and we had a way to prevent it and had a, and a way to keep people from getting hurt. And, and uh, I, I think sometimes we underemphasize the importance of how the planning on the safety directly uh, impacts the efficiency and the, the success of these bar pools. Yeah, right. And that, that's definitely going to impact, like you said, the safety. Um, if, 
you know, eliminating all the things that happen with the wire and, and how that would affect production on job. If somebody gets injured, right? One, you have the, the guilt of somebody getting injured and whatever repercussions that's going to have for the contractor, you know, both emotionally and financially. Um, generally, most, most guys are not going to step over you, the guy that's on the ground to continue the pull, right? They're going to make sure that person's right. So things kind of come to a standstill. If it's a bad math accident, there might be investigations involved, right? So the, like Johnny said, this safety plan, is it's imperative to do this. A lot of people don't. Um, and it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? Like it, if something you don't think matters, doesn't matter until it does, right? Meaning if there is an injury and, and you know, lawsuits are going to happen or stuff like that, we're going to be like, well, what did the safety plan look like? Oh, what safety plan? That's a problem, right? If you can show you did all the processes, you were being acting in a responsible and reasonable fashion, you're just going to be in a much better position. All right, the next step we talked about is the feeder schedule, right? On most sets of plans, you're gonna have your feeder schedule that's showing the from to, conduit size, uh, the wire lengths, usually are not gonna be on there because that's gonna depend upon how the conduits run, but it would have the number and sizes of wires and if you're color coding them, right? So you need to work on developing this, this feeder schedule now, the feeder lengths, we may not know what the exact lengths are going to be quite yet when we're planning this job, unless it's, you know, a heavily engineered job. But in our takeoff, we, you know, if you put together a bid, you should have a pretty close idea. And what that's going to allow us to do is to do some calculating a little set in a little minute, right? This is going to help us figure out those wire lengths, the total, you know, total weight of, of copper aluminum we're going to have on a job, which you need for bidding purposes anyway. But further, it's going to allow us to do that real planning and start to think, how am I organizing these poles? Um, you know, do I have some poles that are essentially the same pole? They're just running, you know, I got four conduits right next to each other going to and from the same place. Because then I can potentially eliminate reels by doing some stacking. All right. It also gives you the foundation for the pole calculators because you can look at these runs. So we want to build out the reels. This is what we're talking about when we're stacking up the reels is if I know I have multiple runs, I can put them in layers on one reel. You know, kind of the, the old way of doing this is you would just order, even if it's a parallel set of reels, you would order the length for the total of the runs you're gonna need. But what happens there is as, as the crew is pulling them off the reels, nobody wants to be the person that cut that wire short. So that's the often happen on jobs area, like a couple extra feet on this one, a couple extra feet on this one. And when you get down to that last pull on the reel, there's not enough wire left uh, for that last pull. What this does is it actually helps you determine, okay, I'm gonna put this one of this length in, that's gonna actually be cut. Ideally you have those heads crimped on we wrap some shrink wrap on it and put the next layer on and so on and so on. And, and DJ is uh, doing a class on this next Wednesday if, if you wanna dive deep into how to actually stack these on the reels. But if we look at this, this particular reel here, it's gonna have one, two, three, four separate runs on it. Well, that's you know eliminating the number of reels I need to handle. I might've done that on four reels previously. Um, if I were doing a parallel, it could be the difference of one reel versus potentially 14, 15, 20 reels. All right, it's helping you to determine the total size and weight of those reels. So you can kind of see it will start to label out the heights and widths of the reels. They'll give you the weight of the reels. So you can think about what are my material handling needs? Am I gonna be able to fit through doorways? Am I gonna be able to unload it off the truck with the equipment that's on the job site? Or do I need to potentially, you know, coordinate with operating engineers or get a special piece of equipment to unload the reels at the job site? Um, it also makes it so that you lose some of these transition errors, uh, transposition errors is like I send an email saying with the spreadsheet, these are things I want. And then the distributor is entering it into his system and then so on and so on. And each step in that process is a step for something to go wrong. All right. And then, when the reels come out, they're actually going to have this attached to them that will show 
the breakdown of what's exactly on that reel. And I'll label it pole one, pole two, tell you the length. It will tell you where your from two labels are, type of wire, do you have the ground on it, a heads on it, and the colors and sizes of those wires, just so that people are putting the, putting the right wire in the right conduit. All right, we need to think about where we're going to set the reel and puller up. So site limitations, and this is, you know, we, we're going to work a plan, but construction sites are very fluid. Uh, maybe you were planning a certain setup and they decided they're going to pour concrete in a certain spot one day, or one of the other trades, it's a heavy piece of equipment, or uh, a lot of times on jobs, you'll see them trying to load in all the sheetrock before the walls are built because it's easier for them to get it in, but now they're stacking it up in your way. We want to think about where we're going to set those reels and the puller up. Um, do I have any ramps I need to get up, loading docks, do I have small doorways I need to get through? We want to think about the best way to handle that reel. In this case, we're showing our simple flange, which we'll talk more about in a second. Um, but otherwise, is my reel on a cradle and I'm using pallet jacks? Well, you know, this floor's kind of got a lot of debris on that. Is that going to be a problem with the pallet jack or, or whatever method you're using to roll it around a job site? So I want to think about where I'm putting them, but also how I'm getting them there and what's the best way to do that. Here's a picture of kind of, we're talking about eliminating those reels the old way. You know, it's upper right hand corner here. We got our five reels, just black jacket wire. What we're not showing is how's this wire getting off those reels into the conduit. Maybe you have a feeder over here in a corner. Uh, see it more often than not. See one person at each reel with the wire on their shoulder walking it towards the panel. In that case, now you got five people walking wire towards the panel. Do they need to be doing that. Are they causing strain on their back? Um, and just the space those five reels take up. Right. You would think that nobody would be doing single wire configuration anymore. I mean, they've been parallel and real since um, we were getting them parallel starting in the 90s, right? Some, some distributors were better at it than others back then. Um, but there's no reason why those five reels couldn't be one reel parallel. Right. This kind of looks like it's, it's not, but we were at a, a job site uh, last month in, in Las Vegas and uh, the contractor was just trying to get ahead on his wire order and didn't want to take time to figure it out. He bought some equipment from us, but he just ordered master reels of 500,000. The job site was so tight, he's almost going to be forced to set these reels up outside the building and now need to walk those wires around corners and down corridors, whereas he could have just gotten it on a parallel reel and saved himself a lot of time and, a lot of time and effort on a pole. So that time he didn't put in up front, he'll pay probably tenfold in the difficulty of those poles. All right, new way, we're still looking at wooden spools here. Um, you know, that we're using the pro jacks for or real handling, you know, a different type of real jack essentially. But we're looking at parallel spools, right? You can see these, they're actually set up for more than one pole here. We got a ground wire on a flange. Uh, we've got a ground wire on our quick jacks. And they're just pulling that wire up off the floor. You can see they got two guys here. They're really mainly just watching that wire go into the conduit. The conduit's going to come off that reel. So I think about which way is easier, which eliminates the hazards of how we're pulling things. Um, again, if we can minimize how many reels we're needing to move around, how many associated pieces, right? Because for every reel, if you're using jacks, you got two jacks. These all look like they're appropriate size jacks, but a lot of times on jobs with the older style jacks, they have the most contractors are gonna have one size, which may be too big and, and the arbor of that reel sits below the jack and you need to physically lift that axle up onto the reel jack. So we wanna look at both ends of the pole to think about where it makes sense to set up that reel, um, where it makes sense to set up the puller, and we have some options now that, you know, back in the day we didn't used to have. Because you need to pull it one way or the other. There's nothing that says that you need to pull from 
from the gear out or into the gear. It's, it's really what's gonna be best for you, right? And what equipment you have available as a contract. So look here, they're actually using the flange. They're gonna move that wire right up against that switch gear, you know, through a relatively narrow doorway. They're not gonna to need to set it up out in the hallway. They're not gonna to need to put it on a bunch of real jacks. They got a parallel set there. You can see it shrink wrap. Kind of can't make out that label, but it looks like there's more than one set on there. So there's probably two different poles off that one reel. You know, so if we looked at that old way, that would have been 10 reels or the five reels that you're gonna try and do two poles off of versus just that one, that flange. All right, and here they actually got the puller set up out by the transformer, right? Well, old, older bolt style transformer, where do you bolt in it to out there? There's nothing that's dirt. Um, they're using a 6K puller there, it just props into place. So you have the flexibility based on the equipment you have to maybe do things a different way, right? Between this setup here, it's gonna take you know a few minutes for them to reel that into place, set the chocks and get the nose connected. It's going to take probably less than 10 minutes to get that puller set up. So from the time they kind of said go, you go set up, you go set up, they're, they're starting to pull probably in less than 10 minutes. We're also looking at the quick rope there, and we'll get into that when we talk about like your pieces of equipment, right? We got one rope, 916 size, it's rated for 32,000 pounds. We don't need to have a different variety of ropes. It's lower stretch. Um, fairly minimal stretch so you don't get that surge when you're pulling. All right, we talk about that reel, we keep keep kind of pounding on the reels here. Is, is this is something we see a lot of stubbornness around. Um, how will it feed into the raceway? You'll see folks that always wanna pull the wire off over the top of the reel. And part of that is because they're used to setting the wire up far away and it's easier to get it onto your shoulder from the top of the reel. Well, if you think about the curvature of the wire, it kind of has a memory to it as it comes off that reel. So if I'm pulling down, generally I do want to be coming over the top of the reel because that curvature of the wire is going to just kind of use the weight of the wire to feed it into the conduits. If I'm pulling up, however, I'm going to want to set that reel upside down and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, and again, a lot of that's just kind of that old school mentality, like how do I pull it off the reel? It's like, you don't need to, the puller will, because that wire is just gonna come off the bottom of the reel and go up into the switch gear, right? When we look at our, this is our simple reel here. These reels are designed, they can hold up to 6,000 pounds of wire on it. Again, you'd look at doing that parallel stack configuration. What does that allow you to do? It allows one person to move it around the job site we can get through a 36 inch doorway. That's actually a, a double width doorway there. We can get through a 36 inch doorway. But the most important thing is they're gonna roll this around right behind that switch gear. You know, you got your minimum dead space back there, but there's enough room to get that reel set up. It can turn in its own spot. You know, you pull one side one way and push the other side the other way and it can spin in its own space, kind of like a tank. Um, and you can line it up right next to the conduit you're gonna pull, set the chocks, peel a shrink wrap off and connect the heads and you're gonna be pulling. We talked about the cable pull calculations, right? So we have a couple different sets around this. One is we wanna perform the calculation for each pull because that's gonna give us some insight into potentially running our conduit a different way. That's why we wanna do this at the planning stage. We wanna make sure that we're not pulling cable outside the cable specs. We don't wanna exceed the, the sidewall pressure or maximum pulling tension. So we can identify those problems areas, again, before we install the raceway. Once we install the raceway, we're locked in. Uh, you know, and I, I, I can honestly say that I've been on jobs where, you know, wire got stuck and now you're trying to install sweeps after the fact or install pull boxes after the fact. We want to identify that before we ever run a piece of conduit so we can minimize wasted time. All right, if I know the tensions and sidewall pressures, I can determine a proper equipment I need. And I can also allocate that labor needed for each pole. Um, a lot of times folks here, we're gonna pull wires. So they're just in their heads, they're thinking six to eight people, because that's what we always have. We always have you know two or three people on a pole end. We have 
four or five people on the feed end, and we got people on radios. But once you go through the step of doing the calculations, you might determine that that's not necessary. So this is just a sample of a poll calc and how we're using it to make decisions. So this is this is a poll. It's a a fairly ambitious poll, or or would have been we we would never used to have done this poll. This is a it's a poll. It's a poll about 455 feet with 790s in it. Uh, you know, you'd still have your poll box to meet the code after your 360 degrees of bend. But here we put it into the cable poll calculator, and this is just a screenshot. And we see, hey, our tension pretty good. 2,500 pounds, not a hard pull, but we're exceeding that recommended sidewall pressure. We, we tell you we don't want to exceed, the cable doesn't want you to exceed 1,000 pounds of sidewall pressure. All right, so at that point, you can say, oh, we're not going to do a pull, we're going to put in a pull box, or you can start to think a little bit and be like, well, a lot of times when pulls are harder, we put in a sweep because that's going to minimize that sidewall pressure because sidewall pressure happens around your bends. Uh, you know, tension happens along the whole pelt, but that side wall, wall pressure is happening at the vents. But, well, most folks, they say, well, if we're going to put in sweeps, we're just going to put in sweeps everywhere. Because that's just, again, that's just kind of old school thinking. You know, it's going to be hard pull, put in sweeps everywhere. Well, using this, you can kind of do a couple quick what ifs. And this whole run will take you about five minutes into the calculator once you get familiar with it. But you can kind of go, what if, what if I just replace those last two elbows with 36 inch sweeps. You know, this is a, a three and a half inch conduit. So all I did was change those two elbows. My pulling tension, again, nothing really changed there, but look at that sidewall pressure. I mean, we more than have that sidewall pressure. As a matter of fact, you could probably go through a couple more 90s and a few hundred more feet and still not exceed that sidewall pressure if you have some more, if you continue with sweeps. Um, what does it mean? I can do this pull in one shot now instead of two, instead of having to pull wire out of a box um, or pulling from both ends, meeting in the middle and I'm gonna splice it and some other things that are there, right? I can also do what if, of a, what happens if I reverse the pull? Does that make it any easier? You know, but back in the day, there's a way to hand calculate these pulling tensions. Uh, I've never seen anybody do it other than for the class they're taking or for a test. Um, we can identify where we put those long radius elbows. You can do a quick what if on aluminum burst cop. We're gonna find out with, you know, most people think, well, because aluminum isn't as great a conductor as copper, I'm gonna need a larger size for my ampacity. I'm probably gonna to need to upsize my conduit. We find more often than not, you don't need to upsize your conduit because of the way the aluminum is done. Uh, this compact stranding on it, it's compacted. So usually you can fit it in the same conduit, but this would verify for that. And we talk about how do you make that impossible pull possible? If we didn't do the calculation, somebody said, hey, let's give this a try. Guess what? They're getting stuck out here. or They're damaging the cable. But by taking that couple minutes to do the calculation ahead of time, that pole is actually not a hard pole at all. And it's a 455 foot fault with 790s in it, which is, you know, before the no lube wire and, and the ropes and everything else, nobody would have really, you wouldn't have attempted that pole. All right, here's what we were talking about a second ago with the idea that I can eliminate those splices and back feeding, but I need to plan this ahead of time so I can just pull straight through in this case, you know, this little vault here. Um, you can see the nose is going right through that conduit. Nobody's there. All they're doing is verifying that it goes through the, nose, through the conduit smoothly, right? As opposed to, I'm gonna replace a 90 with a, in this case, a, you know, a big box here. Well, what do I do? As soon as I do that, I've now forced myself into two options. I need to pull from both directions and splice this all out in here. Um, you'd probably be hard pressed to fit all those splices in that box. We could probably also say that, I'm guessing that box is probably a violation if I don't have enough, the radius there, six times the radius there. Anyway, in lieu of splicing, what are you gonna do? You're gonna stretch this wire out 
and look, like they tried to do the right thing here and spread out tarp to keep from getting grit and grit and dirt and rocks on that wire, but it's not all there. Um, but beyond that, how is all this wire getting handled? How many people are they going to have lumping this wire around, getting tangled up, tripping over it? In this case, they also have it tied out to the truck there. Uh, you got that long section of exposed rope. They're half hitching. They're doing all these things, right? Why do that when you can just pull straight on through? But you need to do that calculation, right? We're coming back against that reel, the weight. If I can determine what my heaviest reel is going to be, you know, based upon how we stacked them out in the calculator, I know what kind of equipment I need to lift that reel, you know, whether I'm using a lull on a job site, forklift, pallet jack, um, or other wire handling options. I also know if I can fit on, do I need to worry about freight elevators on a job? You know, if it's a new job, maybe there's an outside hoist that has some weight limits on it. Um, are there particular doorways I need to go through? If it's particularly if it's a renovation job, one of the jobs I did way back in the 90s, we were doing a 30 story riser in an existing building. To, they were, the elevator was still on the DC system and they were changing over to AC. Like we couldn't physically get the reel up to the mechanical room upstairs because there was a, you access that through a scuttle hole. Um, so I had to set the reel up in a staircase, you know, we were pushing the weight limit on that freight elevator to get it up there. There were all kinds of things involved in that, you know, and we were able to do some calculations there, but again, that's just all going to come out of either the cable pole calculator or that configurator. We'll give you those things. All right, we talk about the simple heads. When does it make sense? Um, I'm going to say probably just about every time, all the time, just get in the habit of standardizing it. The cost of them is not that much. Um, what you're eliminating here, and here this is, you just got, I don't know, you got four people watching them connect the thing to the clevis. Uh, I would, I would go ahead and recommend, you know, if you're, if you're out in the field doing this, I actually attach the clevis through the, through the hooks on the heads while it's still tied down on a reel because they're all being held in one place and I don't need two people holding the wire. Um, and then you pull it off and connect the ear rope and you're ready to pull, right? What you're not doing here is spending time stripping a wire, having people pull up box cutters. Um, you know, there's a couple different ways of making a head. If you didn't have the pre crimped heads, you're gonna put a basket on there. You're gonna put like the old style Allen key grips that kind of look like the barrels, but they go in with Allen keys, which usually are ended up pulling off some of the extra uh, strands of wire to get them to fit in there or you're doing like an old school, you're gonna skin back two or three feet of wire and actually weave a head up, right? And then so many guys were like, oh, why do I need that? I've never lost a head. It's like, yeah, but how many poles have you gotten stuck? Cause the head you made was just a gigantic knot of unflexible wire, right? These come, they're gonna stagger them out. So it'll go around the nineties easily. They're guaranteed not to come off. Um, no knives involved, so we're eliminating those those cut injuries. And Southwire is actually going to guarantee that those won't come off on a pole, right? We see talking to some people short poles versus long poles. Um, well, it's a short pole, so I really didn't need it because my tension's not going to be that great. If you're going to need a head, you may as well just do it, you know. And pretty much on any pole, it's not like you can throw a half inch around around a wire and pull it through the conduit because that rope is going to get in the way. So it makes sense just about every time. And it's also just standardizing that thing so folks get used to using them. And again, that key is we're eliminating those box cutters, people pulling like knives out of their boot to strip the wire. All right, the pole on a rope, we wanna match the rope size to the pole. Again, used to have, you know, half inch, five eighths, seven eighths, three quarter inch ropes, depending upon the tension you're gonna be, it'd be a double braid composite rope uh, It's heavy. A decent amount of stretch, not as much as like an old nylon, you know, uh, twisted rope, but it would still stretch. And you'd see as you're pulling that wire into the conduit, you get a surge. Um, you know, the people on a feet end are going, what are they doing on that pulling end? Cause you know, the wire goes two feet and then stops. And then a couple of seconds later, it goes two feet. Well, the pulling end is pulling, What's happening is that ro old style rope is stretching out and then it's surging. 
stretch, compress, stretch, compress, right? And I always talk about here is the, you know, because I do do a lot of stuff with the apprentices, you know, where this wire, this one is coming out, but we take apprentices, you know, before no lube wire came out, Who's lubing up that wire? It's usually the least experienced guy on a job. It's usually a first year apprentice. Um, where's the most, one of the most dangerous spots to be on a pole? Right where the wires go into the conduit because if it is surging, your hand can get banged up against the conduit and you know, almost literally get pulled into it. So we have this tendency, even though electricians like to think we're real safe, we're trying to put the least experienced person in the, in the worst possible spot, right? So the combination of the no lube wire, we look at the rope, we talk about all those old sizes of rope you need. Our 916th rope is rated for 32,000 pounds, which is the same as an old style 7 8 inch rope. Um, so now you just have one rope to manage. A 600 foot rope weighs about 50 pounds, so it's lighter. We saw in one of the earlier pictures, we'd actually have the rope where instead of having it on our reel, we'll put it in a garbage can or some sort of bin. Well, it eliminates another set of reel jacks to carry around the job site and manage, right? We want to make sure that puller is matched to the pull calculation. You know, we have our 3K, we have our 6K, and we have our 10K. You know, and there's some instances, well, like I could use a 6K or I could use a 10K at high speed because I might need to drop that 6K down to low gear. Um, so it might be more efficient to use the 10K. And you just want, and sometimes that's just going to depend upon what you have available. You know, not every contractor is going to have the full slew of, of pullers they're going to have you know, a 6K or they might get a 10K if it's a larger job. All right, triggers. We have our remote triggers, which you can kind of see in the very bottom here. Well, in addition to the trigger on the puller, there's a trigger that stands by the feed end that wirelessly communicates. And this eliminates that miscommunication that happens over the radio. Uh, you know, people yell and stop when something goes wrong and there's that lag time before the people hear it, it gets translated. If the person on a feed end or the pull end takes their foot off the trigger, the pull stops. There are also wireless repeaters that will extend the signal if you're in a building that's got a lot of concrete and rebar. Those have the additional safety function of they have a button on them to stop the pull also. So that could be used by somebody at a pull box or, you know, like I said, I used to do a lot of vertical riser work. You have somebody running a stairwell. Every couple of floors you're passing through a box. And if something was going wrong, they would have the capability to stop the pull. We want to use that swivel clevis because that's going to kind of allow the wire to do what it wants to do and not get the rope all twisted up. We want to think about what other necessary components do we need for this pull? So it just kind of depends on what's available. A lot of folks don't have things that are available. If we look at this top left corner, it's actually our, our cable feeder system. In this case, they weren't really able to set the reel up where, right by the panel where they would want it to. Um, they were kind of lumping this all off, carrying it in by hand. And then, then our, our field tool guy there set up the cable feeder system. And it's like, oh, now this person's just watching it come off the reel. It's captured those kind of box rollers there, unclipped to get the wire out. And I see a bunch of people standing around there. They're really just watching it. They're not, they're not. They're not necessary. That's what we talk about allocating that manpower. Once you figure it out, you realize that I don't need that many people on this pole. I can get folks doing things on a job they need. Obviously here, we just got some people that are probably supervisors or, or other folks that might be involved in ordering stuff and they're just kind of showing off to them. Some other things we have are quick links. A lot of times, um, you know, our ropes come in different lengths. But instead of having the longest rope, maybe you have two shorter ropes because most of your poles are always going to be less than 600 feet. So you don't need a 1200 foot rope. But every now and again, you might have a longer pole. Um, so we have our quick links, which are essentially shackles made of rope. Um, what these can do though, is they can go around a capstan, a traditional clevis sister hook, whatever can't go around a capstan. So when you start to get close, you're left in a situation of, I need to stop and figure out how we can get a couple more foot of rope out. And usually there's half hitches and all kinds of, of scenarios. So I can then wrap it around the capstan and continue the pull. These, you just put them in there, take 
not long to, you know, they pretty much just snap right in and um, it's going to allow you to just pull them right around the capstan without stopping the pole and refiguring. All right, where that wire enters into the conduit, we have our slide it. It's just a low friction mat. They have magnets in them so they can stick to switchgear panels. I'm just kind of tucking at it in the edge of the conduit. Um, you know, this, this switchgear here has a nice, a nice rolled edge, but if that were a sharp edge, you could just lay another one of these across here. Uh, I'd like to think of these as eliminating your duct tape and cardboard that, that we're used to setting a whole bunch of stuff up with or plywood pieces to try and keep the wires from getting scratched. And it's not only protecting the wires, you know, the, the switch gear, every, every piece of equipment nowadays is a lot sharper on the edges than it used to be. Um, so it's just eliminating another potential for hands getting cut and scraped up. But in order to do this, you just need to know what actually is there. All right, and we're just going to talk about some other real options here. Where are we setting them up? We talked about this. We talked about wanting to set it up close to that pull point. We want to try and eliminate that heavy lifting. So whether it's a simple reel where you're never jacking it up or using one of our jack solutions like the Projax, these actually raise and lower with the core of the drill. Uh, the quick jacks there, they have a hand crank to raise and lower the reel without ever needing to pick the reel up. In this case here, we're showing a feeder solution. Um, and this was really, they just used this on the shot to replace. They didn't have a wheel to put there to get it down into the hole. All right. Usually it makes sense to put the grounds on a separate wheel, reel if they're a different size, you know, if they're more than a couple sizes away from your feeder wires. If the ground is much smaller, it tends to bury itself and cause some difficulties coming off the reel. So that's why you're seeing the grounds separate from the parallels. Um, some other options I could talk about, the simple reel here, you can see we got it rolled right up against the switch gear. The wire's going right into the conduit. The person on a feed end is literally just watching that go in. They got their foot in the trigger in case there's a problem. All right, other options are the simple truck. If you have a situation where you know, you're know you maybe pulling from a vault and the truck can pull up alongside of it, well, now you're eliminating the need to ever unload wire. The truck shows up, you do your pulls, the truck drives away. You don't have those reels. Um, you didn't have to take them off the truck and maneuver them into place. And, you know, it doesn't make sense for every situation, but for the ones it does, it just makes a lot of sense. All right. Sometimes you need to adapt to, you know, specific situations, right? We, we make a plan, we've thought of all these things, and something happens on a job site. Uh, a couple different scenarios here. If we look at this middle picture here, you know, they had ordered the simple truck. Now you notice this configuration had the wire coming off the back of the truck. You can either have it come off the sides or the back, depending on what configuration is going to be right. Well, guess what? They had some torrential rains and, and the, the mud wasn't going to be able to support the truck. They didn't want to get the truck stuck. So they, they weren't able to back right up to where they thought they were going to be able to. Right? So through some creativity, somebody is like, hey, let's, you know, our, our uh, field tool that was like, hey, we got an extra reel. Let's set this up, pull it all over here and just use that to keep the wire up and out of the mud and keep that grid off the wire. Uh, top and bottom pictures are an example using the MC feeder cable. Well, they couldn't get the reel into this room, you know, where the risers were going down. So they had a little window in the concrete. They set the reel up outside, roller, through the window, to a feeder, over and down and down a riser shaft. Right, so sometimes you need to be creative, but the idea is not have to figure it out all at once. Is to think about when you're creating that original plan, what could possibly go wrong, so we can have pieces in place. You know, could it have been a wheel there? Yeah, if they had thought it have a wheel there, right? Here they had wheels, they had slings. What are those other pieces that you want to have available just in case? Because you don't want to get stuck in a spot where you can't pull, and people are standing around. And here's kind of another improvised, you know, they weren't able to set the reel up close, so they just used the, the uh, Maxis jacks and the axle just as a spot to keep the wire off the ground, and you see the slide it there. Right, we talk about the debrief and document. We want to think about, you know, this is a lot of times we get that pull in and we kind of wipe the brow and we're just glad it's done with and move on. Right, well, we want to really take that time while it's fresh in everybody's head, what worked well, 
what were our difficulties that we can improve on next time. We want to share this across our organization. Um, because if something, you know, if there's a problem you run into on one job, it's likely to show up somewhere else. And there's nothing worse than making the same mistake twice. You, you want to share that knowledge. Um, and you do see some shops are really, really fractioned um, where they're not sharing this and people hold that knowledge. And that's just not good for the shop. I, I worked for one shop and literally we had like, they called it the dark side and the light side. <laughs> um, and, and those two sides didn't really communicate with each other to the, to the boss's detriment, right? Um, because what works well, we wanna be able to repeat that on future jobs. We wanna document in addition to how we did it, what were our savings on that job? You know, if we went from, we thought we had planned on using eight guys for two weeks and we used four guys for two days, what are, what are the dollar and cents that are associated with that based upon that contractor's labor costs and overhead? Um, because that's the thing that's gonna encourage you to repeat your successes. If you don't tie that to a dollar amount, it becomes sometimes it becomes really easy to convince yourself to not do the things that were successful. All right, now we're kind of to the end. Really, we want to look at that that time we have front planning. We want to use those modern methods, safer and more efficient, right? The trades, um, all the trades, but you know, electricians in particular, if you think about the way these people learn, they learn on a job, they learn through their apprenticeships. It's passed down from, from the older folks to the younger folks. A lot of times those, those innovations take a long time to populate in the field. Again, like, you know, wires being, being paralleled for over 30 years now, it's really well. And you get some people still won't order a parallel spool. And it might be because they had a bad experience with it 30 years ago and they're just never gonna use it, right? It's like, well, people, People have changed, the systems they're using to wrap those wires have changed. Let's take advantage of that. Um, because we wanna to move towards that new normal so we can get those savings, right? So that's what we're looking at is how can we build on our successes to be more efficient? And also really we wanna implore you. And like I said, if anybody's got any questions or wants to jump in, just tell us a story about a job you got coming up or, or a situation or a contract you're working with, is we're here to help, you know, Southwire has, in addition to myself, Johnny and Bill as your trainers, we got our field teams, um, you know, we got our contractor specialists, actually one of them was just over here a couple minutes ago by me picking something up. Heather, right? And if I hear something, I try and, I try and say, hey, you need to talk to Tyler about this or, hey, uh, you know, Don's our tool guy out here. Let's see if we can get him out to your job to take a look at it, hands on. <clears throat> He's got a bunch of equipment he can bring out on a truck to show you guys. And, and that's really the power of what we do here is, you know, obviously the wire is great. It's lowest coefficient of friction, all that, the all and to work as a system efficiently and safely. But then you're also bringing just the years of experience and, and all the different types of jobs folks have been on to, to bear. Right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. I haven't seen any but questions pop up in the chat, but if anybody wants to leap in, raise a hand. I'll raise a hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, documentation. Uh, I, I've been a part of uh, some wire pulls uh, in, in that high rise environment. And one in particular downtown Seattle. And again, it was an experiment. Uh, the question is, is there, uh, is, is there in the works documentation of a of a controlled descent wire pull where rather than paddling upstream, for example, we had uh, a couple of our MCFO1s up on the rooftop. And of course, you know, the high rises that, that are downtown all had cranes on them. And so getting, you know, the feeder wire and, and the feeders and all that stuff up on the roof was fairly easy, um, but I've had some contractor guys asking for documentation of that, and uh, I haven't been able to give them any answers to it uh, other than to say, yeah, we've done it, and we've done it successfully, but no, we don't have any documentation. 
yet. Uh, yeah, Tom, I haven't seen anybody that would, uh, you know, and we've asked the question numerous times that say you could use those feeders. In essence, you're trying to use them as like a cable break, right? Um, yeah, so I haven't seen anything along those lines or, or heard anything about that. Um, I, I will say, I've worked with people that they would never drop a riser. I've worked with people that will only drop risers and never would pull up. Um, I've been in, I've been on jobs that have done either, you know, successfully. I've been on jobs that have had problems with either. Also, um, you know, the when you look at the safety hazards of it, it it's kind of twofold, right? If I'm pulling up. The fear is always I'm going to break a rope and, and that's going to run away. Well, rope technology has come a long way. Also, with the with the low friction on a wire right now, really you're just battling that weight of the wire. Um, and and most risers are relatively straight. They might have a 90 at the bottom and a 90 at the top. You know, you think about a 30-story building, 300 feet. It's it's a significant weight of wire, but it's nothing that a puller couldn't pull. Um, Likewise, if you're trying to drop that riser, though, now you're trying to hold back the weight of that wire. And again, those, those feeders really aren't, I haven't seen any like testing or documentation to say that this feeder can withstand a certain amount of, you know, their intent to make the pull easier, not to make it harder at, in essence, if that makes sense. Joe, I can kind of maybe add a little at uh, Tom. So we, we, I would always suggest looking at doing a pull calculation, having the wire down below and pulling up because, you know, you get people out of the way and, you know, if the rope breaks, you're certainly it's going to fall, but hopefully you won't have anybody in harm's way because you can set up that reel yeah. uh, where you can be away from it. And I've heard of some people rigging a, you know, it's like if you're mountain climbing, you got the, the, the device, I'm not even sure what it's called, but if you. Yeah, like uh, a belay device. Right. So if you suddenly move quickly, it's going to grab that rope and hold it. Uh, even like a seat belt on your car or your truck, you know, if you jerk it, it, it's going to grab it. And so if you put one of those safety devices on that rope up top somewhere uh, or, or or wherever and, and have that as, as something that could work. I've heard of people actually tying a second rope and having that second rope pass through that, that uh, brake device so that if, uh, if the main rope gave, boom, it's going to grab it and stop, you know? So that, that's kind of my thoughts on it. Um, I think there actually is, there may be some, some verbiage in the, the cable, wire and cable manual at Southwire, but Tom, I'd have to dig in that and see. Um, someone who might have would be Dave Watson, might have uh, one of our engineers, might have some uh, information on it that might be helpful. Super Dave. Super Dave. <laughs> All right, any, anybody, like you said, I, I've, I've seen various contraptions and, and some of them were, seemed like it made it go real nice and some of them, it's scary, you know, it's scary when you think about, you know, potentially 5,000 pounds of wires falling in either direction, whether you're feeding from the top or down, the end result if something goes wrong is the wire's going to end up at the bottom, right? It, um, it, it absolutely <laughs> is. If you're feeding down, you know, how are you going to put a break on that wire to stop yeah. it is the question. If you're feeding up, you by doing the pull calculation, you're going to know what that tension is uh, with the weight of that wire. You know, when it gets to the top, if it's 2,000 pounds or whatever, you know your tugger is going to be able to, to yeah, pull and it, you, and you know yeah, that you're, you know your, your tugger and rope are rated for that, then then that's, it's it's much more of a guaranteed entity. Like I said, nothing I've I've never seen. Um, anything used for dropping it that anybody would would put a guarantee on or stand on paper behind, including some stuff we, you know, we conjured up and fabricated some solutions on job sites years ago. Um, but you know what? I haven't seen them turn up on a market yet. And the one guy was pretty, pretty entrepreneurial. So I'm sure if he thought an insurance company would cover it, he would have ran with the idea. It was a pretty, pretty solid idea, but it, you know, the, the idea now really is, you know, to what Johnny's saying is the, you know, if you think about a, a set of 500,000 figure five pounds per foot ish, you know, for your wires on a, on a 30 story pole, it's only 1500 pounds of wire, right? 6K pole is rated for 6K, 10K is rated for 10K. The, the rope and clevises are all rated, you know, 
and clevis is rated for 10,000 pounds. The rope is rated for 32,000 pounds. You know, the fear of that rope breaking shouldn't be, shouldn't be an issue. And compared to the idea that that wire might run away from you if you're trying to drop it. You know, it's, it's kind of easier to pull on something and exert a certain amount of force than it is to hold back on it, I guess, is, is the caution there. And it's not to say that people aren't doing it every day. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's good until it's not, right? All right, does anybody else have a question? Thank, thanks, Tom, for chiming in. All right, I guess if we haven't seen anything, I'm not seeing anything in chat or the Q&A there. Have you, Beth? No, I haven't. No, All, right. <clears throat> All right, yeah, we're going to wrap up. And Beth, what time is DJ's configurator class next? It's moved to next It is there, on right? the... Yes, it's fifth. It's the fifteenth, and it's at ten a.m. Eastern. So he decided to do it in the morning. Okay, and what I'll we'll say for you know for those who are still with us here on a configurator, a lot of people are reluctant to this idea of stacking reels, and, and my my suggestion is pick something simple. Almost on every job, you have you know a, a set of poles from one one piece of equipment to another piece of equipment that are parallel that might only have a few fit difference. Start with that. That's kind of your easy entry. I'm going to put these three poles on one reel and eliminate the need to set up different reels at that point um, without a whole lot of thought. Are they different lengths? Does it matter which order I pull them in? Uh, it's, it's just pretty, pretty relative easy entry point. All right. Well, thanks, Beth. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And we appreciate, yeah. we appreciate it and take some time out of your day. Have a good afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>